I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. Australia's defence posture is in for its biggest shake-up in decades. Fewer armoured vehicles, more long-range missiles and, of course, nuclear submarines. Tomorrow's Defence Strategic Review is all about the heightened prospect of war, which the government's taking very seriously. Likewise, major changes at the Reserve Bank are on the way, after recommendations of an expert review were adopted in full. But when it comes to the budget, it's a different story. The government has not rushed to embrace the recommendations of its hand-picked advisers. One expert panel has called for a substantial increase in the rate of job seeker. The other, focusing on women's equality, says the single parenting payment and rent assistance must be urgently addressed. Labor says it simply can't afford to do everything it would like. I'll ask the Finance Minister, Katie Gallagher, about the government's priorities a little later. But first, here's the panel. Samantha Maiden, Peter Van Onselen and Tom Crowley. David. Let's start with uh, these two reports. So one is the uh, Women's Economic Equality Task Force. This was set up at that Jobs and Skills Summit back in, uh, in September. The other is from the Economic Inclusion Advisory Committee, a panel led by uh, Jenny Macklin, the former Labor Minister, and that was set up uh, to win over the support of David Pocock, the independent senator, to, um, to pass the, the government's industrial changes. Sam, what's the, the thrust and even the common ground between these two reports? Well, basically, these are very expensive things to fix. I mean, the common ground is that uh, they cost a lot of money. Um, and in terms of uh, the issue around um, single parent payments and all the rest of it, there's an issue of atonement here. Because this is, of course, on the same day that Julia Gillard gave her I will not be lectured by that man on misogyny speech. She made some changes that really hurt um, women on welfare. And so I think there's a sense that they want to atone for that, but also there's a sense that that's really expensive and that they don't have the money to make those changes right now. It's also obviously about job seeker, um, but the sort of changes that they're looking at there that would, you know, be a really substantial boost. Um, I don't see that there's a lot of political will to do that. No, right we'll now. come. We'll come to the reaction to it and the political will and the cost of it. But the recommendations themselves in these reports, Tom, and I should point out your former Treasury, former Grattan Institute, you've, you've looked at a lot of these sort of arguments over the years. Do they, do they make a strong case in these reports for the changes they're suggesting? I think in the abstract, and I think particularly JobSeeker probably deserves to be in its own category of urgency. I think that particularly in the cost of living context, the um, you know the difficulty and the stories, the, the numbers that we're hearing about poverty make a pretty compelling case on that one. More broadly, I think it's reasonable for the government to kind of step back and say, well, we can't do all of these things at once in the fiscal context. It's obviously not especially helpful to have their own committees sort of bolstering the prominence of these ideas right in the lead up to budget, um, but they're not they're not new ideas. Uh, and I think, you know, a Labor government was always going to come under pressure for, for these sorts of things in the lead up to budget. So it's a difficult position for them to navigate. Yeah, I mean, Peter, they're not new ideas, but Tom's point is right. These are the committees that Labor actually asked experts. They said, go and come back to us before the budget with what we need to do. It's pretty hard to brush it off. Oh, absolutely. It builds the cat on, if you like, the, the superficiality of when they say, oh, we'll accept all the findings around the RBA and issues like that, because that's the easy stuff. This is the hard stuff. It's a hand-picked committee, but it is hard, exactly as Tom says. And frankly, it requires wholesale tax reform, wholesale federation reform, in my view. Because it's expensive, you can't just do it quickly or easily. If they want to institute some of these important reforms that are going to cost money, they then also need to have a proper holistic look at how they collect revenue, how much they need as a government, as a percentage of GDP mm. in terms of tax. They don't want to have that discussion. They haven't done the equivalent or announced the equivalent of what the Hawke government did around the 1980s tax summit. Uh, they don't seem to want to go in that direction. And if you try to do it in a piecemeal sense, big ticket expensive items like the ones being talked about in these reports simply don't happen or at least don't happen quickly. But so in terms of belling the cat as well, right, yeah. like there's a lot of scar tissue within Labor um, about people, including Jenny Macklin when she was on the front bench, spending a lot of money and having a lot of, you know, no doubt um, wonderful ideas but what that did to them in opposition in terms of how they had to raise the money. Now that's how they ended up with the franking credits and, and all the other bits the and bobs election. in 2019. Mm. Now, they didn't want to go down that path at that election, but, of course, what they're finding out in government is these problems don't go away. And at some point, you do have to explain what you're going to do and how you're going to pay for that. And that's a discussion like, they avoided at the last in, election. In the same week that this report comes out that they balk at whether they'll implement all the elements of it, 
Jim Chalmers says we won't be adjusting the GST. Now, I get that Labor seems to have some sort of aversion to the GST, but that's one of the important areas of taxation, consumption tax, and how you might adjust that, that it has to be part of a debate, at least. When we had the Henry Review after Kevin Rudd got elected, you know, Ken Henry was specifically told that he couldn't look yeah, at the like GST. Now that he's not constrained by any of that, he's, he's back in, in academia yeah. and free of all of that, he says the GST is one of the things that needs yeah. to be looked at. Tom? Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose, like, it is a much bigger problem. You've got to go back as far as the Henry Review. We know that the list of things that we expect governments to do is growing and growing, and growing with many worthy things like the NDIS, necessary things like the cost of an ageing population and the care needs of that population. But we've just had this sort of, you know, staggeringly immature conversation for decades about the other side of that, which is how do you pay for it? And whether that is in the form of kind of a full-throated bid to raise more money or a full-throated bid to spend less. You've got to go back about a decade for a government that had a go at either. Abbott failed with the spending side and Gillard and Rudd failed with the tax side. There's just not much courage behind it. So we I think need to have that philosophical debate, don't you do, we? You do, you do. How and much I think, does government spend? You know, the government is, is making the right noises about understanding that and having that conversation, but what we've yet to see and what I hope to see is some of the ambition to match that. Yeah. Well, certainly the... Independent Senator David Pocock, who I mentioned, was you know the one who demanded this committee be set up to go and provide some advice on these support payments. He was rather nonplussed with how the government reacted to these recommendations that the budget's basically too tight. Here he was. If you want to hear about tight budgets, talk to people who are deciding between medicine and food. That's a, that's a tight budget. And for a government that won't touch $250 billion of stage three tax cuts, which are going to the wealthier Australians, I, I frankly just don't buy it. It often does seem to come back to that stage three tax cut debate over and over again, but the Treasurer is holding the line. I think it's a good thing, frankly, whether it's David Pocock or the panel or others, that people have views about this. Our job uh, is to recognise that good people make suggestions to us in good faith. Uh, we can't do everything at once, and so we work out what we prioritise, and that's what we're doing right now in the lead-up to the budget on the 9th of May. Yeah, we work out what we prioritise, and that's the point. Budgets are about priorities, and we'll find out in a couple of weeks. And the other problem that they've got, which no doubt Katie Gallagher will talk to you about, is that the Coalition booby-trapped the budget. Now, I know that all governments say that, but they haven't, in many cases, funded things um, on an ongoing basis. So, yeah, in that's fact, a... that's that's a point they're going to make tomorrow when the defence strategic review is released. And you know, you've seen a bit of it over the weekend, saying the coalition promised all these defence projects, didn't put the money in to pay for them. What they announce tomorrow, we'll see. They've got a bit of the bad news out of the way early, really stripping back the number of these. Um, light armoured vehicles to pay for the new kit. It's going to be, from what I'm told, a cost neutral exercise over the forward estimates at least over the next four years. So yeah. yes, defence spending will grow over time, but they're trying to contain it for now. Yeah, they are, because presumably they do want to do some of these other things. But can we just call out this idea that we can't do everything all at once? Yeah, you can. You're a government. You've got a massive bureaucracy. If you've got courage, political courage and political will, you can do a lot at once. And you look at the Hawke-Keating government, you look at the Howard government, they did a lot at once. And mm -hmm. governments have a finite political capital, even when the opposition leader is someone like Peter Dutton. They still have finite political capital. If you don't get it done early, you don't get it done at all. And that should have been the lesson from when the Rudd and Gillard governments didn't get it done early. That should have been the lesson from the Abbott, Turnbull, so this, Morrison this, governments. They, they really need to do something in this budget, oh, otherwise it gets GP too... I totally agree, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the government may never be as popular as it is now. The opposition may never be as weak. And you've got a context, I think, with cost of living where people may be sort of more willing to, you know, accept yeah. the fact that you've got to take some big steps. So, yeah, I think so. And I think stage three is just a symptom of where we're at with this conversation because, I mean, you know, I know it's a sort of a hackneyed thing to talk about it, but the tax cuts are mad. No treasurer in their right mind would design them right now if they didn't exist for the current economic climate. With, with inflation. Where it yeah, is. with inflation where it is, of course not, but we're stuck with it. And it's really only kind of stage one as far as the tax conversation that we need to have, but we can't even get past that to, they, to a bigger conversation. If they can announce that they're going to change those and go to an election first, just like what John Howard did with implementing the GST after saying never ever, and then it doesn't cause a political well, problem. They are due to start mid but they, I think mid it would cause year. a political but, problem well, for them. Well, no, but they have to have the courage to do that. That's, that's the point. I mean, it's just weasel words to say we can't do everything all at once. That's the problem with modern politics. It's become incrementalism. Yeah 
nationalism. There's no real leadership. Make and they PBO just to Prime be Minister power. for the day. He's got it sorted. Everything. Just um, before I do get to um, to the minister, I just want to also note on this budget discussion what's at stake for Peter Dutton. He's got a budget reply to deliver at the end of that budget week. And uh, look, there is a view growing that I've been picking up this week in in Liberal ranks that this is a bit of a test for him. Things are going terribly for the opposition. We know at the moment they want to see, as one put it to me, a tent pole announcement to show that he does actually have something to turn things around for the Libs. What, what do you think is at stake for him? Well, I think everything's at stake. I mean, the biggest thing Peter Dutton has going for him is that there's no one else. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of... I think they've got to find something of substance to say in response to, to mm. this budget. I think it's really getting to the point. Of, you know, we don't expect a fully costed policy document from it's the something. opposition at this point, but, you know, what is the direction? And I think, you know, as far as that immature tax conversation... You look at the response to, you know, fairly minor super changes and I think the opposition bear a lot of responsibility for that. Well, time to talk to the Minister for Finance and the Minister for Women, Katie Gallagher, to take us there. He was the chair of the Women's Equality Task Force, Sam Mostyn. Women keep telling us, you know, they wonder when they will be seen. They took great heart in a government that came to power with some very big commitments made to women, a much more diverse parliament, many more women in the parliament, and, and a commitment in the women's budget statement just in October. That was a document signed by the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and the Minister for Women. Katie Gallagher, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on, Dave. So is this the moment? Will there be action to address women's economic inequality in this budget? Well, I think uh, you saw in October the fact that we responded with some investments in childcare, in PPL, in paid domestic and family violence leave, in the respect at work recommendations. So I think that set the signal that we are deadly serious about addressing women's inequality across the economy, uh, but across the community more broadly. Um, the Women's Economic Equality Task Force, with Sam as the leader of that task force, has provided us with a letter outlining some of those initial priorities. They'll provide us with a report uh, in the next month or so, which finalises their work. But yeah, we're deadly serious about doing something and you know we are going to take steps in every budget that we're in government to address inequality across the economy. Well, let's look at some of those steps and some of the recommendations that that task force has made in this letter that you referenced there. Number one, their number one priority for this budget, they say, needs to be the single parent parenting payment uh, for, at the moment for women, once their youngest child turns eight, they lose the payment. Do you agree that the bills don't stop for a single mum or a single dad uh, when their youngest turns eight? Well, of course they don't stop when they turn eight. Um, the arrangements at the moment are that you move on to the job seeker payment. And lose about $100 um, a week? And this, is, and this is the issue that's been raised by the Women's Economic Equality Task Force and others. Uh, and we're having a look at it. Um, you know, we don't set up these task forces to then um, not seriously consider the recommendations that they come forward with. Um, the budget will look to do as much as it can uh, within, you know, the responsible fiscal environment that we are in. Uh, to deal with addressing disadvantage and inequality where we can. I understand the Expenditure Review Committee is looking at lifting that cut-off age to 12. Um, do the bills get any cheaper once the, the child starts high school? You don't want high school kids starting off in poverty, do you? Well, again, we're looking at the recommendations from the Women's Economic Equality Task Force. I'm, I'm a member of the ERC, but I don't disclose what goes on in the ERC. Um, we are looking at the recommendations and, you know, you'll see some of those outcomes in the budget. Is it fair to say that you, Katie Gallagher, in that ERC are pushing pretty hard to lift it right back up to the age of 16, where it used to be? Well, as I just said, I don't talk about uh, the ERC or what uh, my views or any other member of the ERC's views is. You know, it's a responsible government. We get these reports. It's a collegiate approach across the ERC. We have feedback, of course, from our caucus colleagues as well. Um, these issues, aren't, uh, you know, they're being raised with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not just those members of the ERC, and we, we're seriously looking at it. We want to ensure that within the environment we're in, you know, where we've got a range of pressures coming at us and those pressures are increasing over the longer term, not decreasing, that we're doing what we can to address women's equality but also address disadvantage and poverty where we can. Well, women over the age of 55 are now the cohort most at risk of homelessness. Uh, both of the expert panels you've uh, commissioned and now received uh, have said the Commonwealth rent assistance must be urgently increased as well. Do you agree that 
soaring rents have left a lot of women in an increasingly vulnerable situation. Well, I think uh, absolutely you're right that the age group that you refer to, older women, um, women without super, I mean, this is the issue more broadly and it can't be solved in one budget or in actually in one parliament and the Women's Economic Equality Task Force makes this point. Um, you know, we. We earn less, we retire with less, uh, we have less assets, less wealth, we earn um, less in lower paid jobs. Um, these, uh, this is the reality of 2023 for Australia's women. And um, this is the work that we have started in the budget. It's the work we're going to continue in this budget and we'll continue focusing on it. And housing for women and providing some security of housing for women, particularly women in that age cohort that you referred, uh, is a real challenge uh, and that's why we've got initiatives like our Housing Australia Future Fund and some of the other measures that the Treasurer is working on with the Housing Accord to look at how we can push and increase the amount of social and affordable housing, particularly for demographic age groups like this. But in, in terms of the rent assistance, it does sound to me like you are hinting this morning that there will be some movement in the budget on that Commonwealth rent assistance. Well, I'm saying in, in general, we are serious about looking at what we can do around housing. I am saying in terms of the recommendations from the mm. Women's Economic Equality Task Force, there were six recommendations of which those, um, you know, parenting payments, single mm. and Commonwealth rent system were two. We are looking at those uh, in the, through the ERC process, haven't concluded a view and we'll, people will see the results of that on budget night. All right, so uh, what about job seeker? Let me ask you about that. You, in opposition, urged the Morrison government to be compassionate, to ensure people could live a dignified life. Do you think those on job seeker are currently living a dignified life? Well, there's certainly, um, you know, pre you know, in terms of job seeker, there's no doubt that people on job seeker uh, do it tough. There's no doubt about that. Are living a dignified um, life, to use your words? Uh, well, I mean, it's hard for me to pass a judgment on that. Like for, for some, you know, I'm not going to say they'd live an undignified life. I am saying that there's certainly um, pressure and, you know, it's, it's hard to live on job seeker. I accept that. The challenge for government and, you know, I note some on the couch, um, you know, don't see this as a real issue, is how we balance up the range of pressures um, across the budget and they're, you know, they're substantial and they're across mm. almost every area in a budget that's been booby-trapped in all of those issues that we've inherited, a trillion dollars of debt, how do we balance up the, all of the need and, and you know, finalise those well, let's decisions? Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about Minister, because I think the government did cost this week uh, what, it would, what it would cost to do all of these things, including the, the job seeker increase that's recommended, and said it would be, what, $34 billion over the next four years, is that right? I think it's in the order, yeah, between 25 and $30 billion across, across those recommendations from the Economic, right. uh, Advisory Com Economic Inclusion Advisory Committee. OK, 25 to $34 billion. What's the cost of the Stage 3 tax cuts over the next four years? Well, those will be updated in the budget, but, you know, they're... I, I can't recall what they are across the Ford estimates. It was, but nearly, 41, you know, it was nearly $41 billion, according to the Treasurer, in October, so it's presumably more than that now. Well, they'll be updated in the budget, David. So it's costing more to do the Stage 3 tax cuts than to implement well, all stage, of these things? The Stage 3 tax, tax cuts are legislated. They're due to come in in July next year. Um, you know, we haven't changed our position on those. And the challenge for us is looking across the budget as a whole, where we can uh, make additional spending, where we can make additional savings and how we make those decisions. And it's a balancing act. There's no doubt about it. We have to balance all of these different pressures, whether it's defence, health, you know, all the investments in Medicare that have a cost of living focus, mm. how we balance all of those and, those, those tax and cuts conclude fit those the balance? decisions. Th those tax cuts are the right balance? Well, we haven't changed our position no, on them, the David. Right, are they the right balance? Well, our, our position is those tax cuts are legislated and we haven't changed our position. Right. My job as Finance Minister is to look, ensure quality spending to make some of those t dis difficult decisions, and there are difficult decisions. I don't want to pretend to anybody that these are easy decisions. They mm. are difficult. Uh, but how do we get that balance right? How do we address disadvantage? How do we support those that are most, most vulnerable? How do we provide cost of living relief? Uh, within the context of the environment we're in. Now, the budget's going to get, um, you know, b be improved in the short term. We'll see um, improvement in the budget numbers in the short term. 
but the longer term pressures on the budget are increasing and mm. we have to focus on that as well. So will the, this budget include any new taxes or tax increases? Uh, well, you'll see uh, the results of that on budget night. I'm not here to, um, to hand the budget down uh, earlier than uh, the 9th of May. All right. Uh, but there might be you, new taxes. Well, well, you'll know we've been clear uh, that we've got our focus on multinational tax reform, our modest changes to high balance super accounts. Um, so, you know, in, in that sense, the answer to your question is yes. You, you will see those reflected in the budget. And the petroleum uh, resource rent tax too? Well, we've received the advice from Treasury. We haven't formed a, a concluded view on that. Um, uh, you know, that was work commissioned by the former government. Uh, it's been going for the last few years. Uh, and, you know, Treasury's view is that uh, they think that there are improvements that could be made to the PRRT. Uh, we're considering those. We haven't formed a view about it, whether it's this budget or this year. Uh, I think the industry sort of are well across what those um, modest changes might be because they've been involved in those mm. consultations. Uh, but we haven't finalised a view on that, David. Yeah, I mean, the industry is pointing out how much tax they currently pay. They, they point out that it's going up. Uh, well, their forecast is that it will go up next financial year considerably, although they haven't said notably how much they're now forecasting their profits uh, to go up next financial year. Are they paying enough tax, the, the gas producers? Well, in terms of the PRRT, um, you know, we haven't finalised a view on that, but I think from our point of view, we want to make sure that, mm. you know, taxpayers are getting the right sort of return through that uh, measure. Uh, and, you know, that's the work that Treasury's done. They think there are um, some changes that could be made. There are a number of different um, recommendations or views put through that and we'll, we'll conclude our discussions on that in the short term. Will there be new savings found in this budget? Uh, yes, we are looking at savings all the time. I mean, this is something that we started in October where we had that considerable uh, savings and reprioritisation exercise. And yes, I mean, the reality is we have to find savings as well. Um, and it's not just savings to return to budget, it's actually finding those savings that can be reprioritised into mm. areas of new need. Um, that's part of the challenge as well. But, you know, we've, we've, we've inherited a budget that's under a lot of stress. We've got a lot of booby traps. We've got a lot of terminating measures where, you know, for example, the Digital Health Agency just loses funding on the 30th of June this year. I mean, seriously, uh, that, that agency presumably needs to keep going. Same with the eSafety Commissioner in some of the uh, funding that that agency has. No, so we're actually having to deal with that and you'll see a reasonable mm. part of the budget is actually addressing these terminating measures, which is essentially the dishonesty of the previous government about the state the budget was in. And when you talk about finding savings and reprioritising that, what about the NDIS? Are we going to see much in this budget in terms of the, the reboot that Bill Shorten's talking about? Well, yeah, Bill outlined some of that at the press club earlier this week. I mean, I, I think the uh, challenge in the NDIS is actually making sure that every dollar going in there, um, and it's a substantial amount of dollars now, is actually delivering the outcomes we want in supporting people with a disability to live a dignified life. Um, and, you know, so some of that might, might involve changes within the scheme, but that's, you know, that he, he went through those at the press club about how we're trying to make sure, you know, things like fraud, uh, making sure that those dollars are not being um, spent other than for the purpose for which they were intended. Finally, on the Reserve Bank, uh, Minister, the review panel, the review into the Reserve Bank, called for more monetary policy expertise uh, around the, the board, a new monetary policy. Uh, board indeed. The government made two new appointments to the existing board uh, on Thursday. Do either of them have monetary policy expertise? David, those two appointments are first-rate candidates for a start. Um, we went through an expression of interest process. Uh, the Governor and Treasury were involved in that. That's the first time that's happened. And I note the Governor in his press conference welcomed those appointments to the board. Uh, from our point of view, Apart from them but having incredible careers of substance, both of those appointees, um, we 
absolutely think that people with experience about uh, working people's lives and about wages um, and wages role in the economy absolutely uh, is important to have reflected on the board. Yeah, but the, the, uh, the review is quite specific about the need for monetary policy expertise, right, to push back at the, yeah. the governor and so on at board meetings. Do either of these two new appointments have monetary policy expertise? Well, absolutely. We think that those, the credentials they bring, both from corporate Australia and from, say, the Fair Work Commission, uh, those views and perspectives and their lengthy and highly distinguished careers absolutely have a role in monetary policy decisions and that they're first-rate appointees and we're really pleased that they've taken up the opportunity. All right, Finance Minister Katie Gallagher, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks very much, David. All right, well, let's return to our panel. We're joined once again by Sam Maiden, Peter Van Onsel and Tom Crowley. Let's just quickly, before we get to the Reserve Bank, uh, pick up on what we heard there. Do you, think, do you think that's all hinting that we are going to see something for women in particular, Sam, in the budget? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I thought she was good. She was quite honest about the fact that there's a couple of things that are clearly going to be in the budget. Um, her perspective on that issue of women and welfare is actually really interesting because... Um, I mean, she didn't actually talk about it in that interview, but the finance minister, actually, when she was widowed um, as a young mother, actually was on those single parent payments. So she has real life experiences, which I think is really fantastic when we get politicians who have actually lived on those payments. And um, she's making that clear that there's something that they want to do. I don't think that they'll do all of it in one go, um, <clears throat> but she's also making it clear that they're going to look at that PRRT tax changes as well. Yeah, although no, no finalised decisions. You were getting close to the but budget. But they're just doing... Finalized. Come on. I mean, like, you don't... Look, I think it's fairly obvious that they're going to do yeah. something in that space. They may not be ticking it off finally until the next meeting, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. all right. Let's turn to the Reserve Bank review. Uh, first review of the bank in 40 years. Tom, what were the main recommendations in, in this review and will it make much of a difference? Well, it depends on who you ask. I think if you're someone who has come to the view that the whole monetary policy architecture is rotten and that interest rates, you know, shouldn't be going up at the moment, you'll be disappointed. There's no kind of earth-shattering shaking of the architecture of monetary policy in this, and there was never going to be. Um, but I think, you know, within the world of monetary policy, it is really significant. Um, and it was, I think, pretty scathing. Like, I think that a lot of Australians would be quite alarmed um, at the you know, extent to which a lot of these difficult decisions were not being stress tested and having the level of rigour applied to well, them. Particularly the, the, expected. the critical decision to give that forward guidance that you know, we won't lift rates until 2024. And it's staggering. What, yeah, what, when you read through the review, what did the board, what were they going off when, when that was decided? Well, nothing. There was no discussion. And I think, I think the review said that they, they couldn't find any evidence of any written communication within the bank that the potential implications of saying we don't expect to raise interest rates until 2024 Which had a was huge discussed. implication. Huge implications. And this is not just hindsight bias either. When you look at the 2016 to 19 period where the view is that rates were too high and that unemployment was too high, there were people outside the bank, experts outside the bank saying this at the time, and there were people inside the bank who had this view but the view was never escalated to the board. Mm. So there are some serious concerns. You know, there are a lot of positive things said about the bank in general, but I think a pretty compelling case is made for a bit of a culture shift. And the review, I mean, it's not just plucking this stuff out of the air. They interviewed um, hundreds of, uh, you know, mm. former staff, existing staff. They interviewed current and former board members and they, they say in the review that some of those they spoke to felt that those board meetings, um, there wasn't much challenging of the governor going on. Uh, one was even... Uh, suggesting it's more of a pub test uh, to, 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 you know, to see how things are going to fly with public reaction and so on. I mean, the changes that have been recommended bring the RBA and Australia, I guess, into line with global best, best practice uh, when it comes to having this separation of, of a monetary policy committee, as it were. I, I think that's right. You know, the governor sort of has the most expertise and the board doesn't necessarily have the equivalent to that, so you can imagine that the governor carries a lot of weight when they're determined... Although some have pointed out over 30 years, we've done pretty well with the, with the sure. system we've had, perhaps even and, better than those other yeah, jurisdictions. And, and it's a tighten up, right? I mean, like, you know, and I, I think I should say, you know, putting macroeconomists on the board is not going to be a silver bullet, it's not going to fix everything, but I think, it, you know, I think there's a pretty compelling case for But the up. fun part <laughs> is that they're going to deputise all of them to go and give speeches and press conferences. Yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> I mean, like, as a journalist, I think it's, it's going to be true, great. I think you, you want to be careful what you wish for because we're going to have different voices. Yeah, I'm not sure they're going to have some of it. fights. And then, and then they're going to put down how they're voting, not individually, but, you know, I can't think, wait. Think it's going to be Think about the conflict, great. the optics of conflict that that's going to create. I mean, Philip Lowe basically just misspoke 
when he said what he did with interest rates Whoa. in 2024. I no, he said it a few times. Yeah, but he misspoke. He, what, you know, he always, like, multiple no, no, times. I'm, I'm not defending the guy about it, but he always had a caveat, yeah. but he wasn't thinking politically that the caveat doesn't matter. Well, he doesn't have People a are hearing one thing, not the entirety of it, or one part of it gets reported, not the entirety of it. I'm not defending him, but it was him misspeaking and him failing to understand the politics of it, which, frankly, is going to contribute to him not getting either way, Well, we'll frank. come to that. Either way, he rejects uh, this whole argument in the review that there's not enough um, testing, challenging pushback around the board table. The review panel did not sit in the boardroom. And the description of how the board process works and the challenge in, in the boardroom that the panel has doesn't particularly resonate with me. So the idea that the board members sit there meekly and accept the recommendation that I put to them is, is very far from the reality that, that I've lived as the governor. So which reality does the treasurer accept, the, the governor's reality or the review's reality? Here he was. Is he wrong in his, his judgment? Well, again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into that, uh, but what I will say is I think that the analysis of the review panel is well-founded, uh, and they relied on more than 1,500 people providing input. They worked on this for months. Uh, people engaged with it right around the country and right around the world. I think they've struck the right balance here between analysing the past and, much more importantly, uh, strengthening the Reserve Bank for the future. He, he doesn't want to That's offend or upset Philip Lowe. I mean, the guy's been cooperative through this, and it must must have been difficult for him. But, but clearly, Jim Chalmers is agreeing with the review yeah. here, isn't he? But yeah, also, that's a whack. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But credit where it's due here. Okay, he misspoke on on rates not going up, and he was wrong. But the consecutive rises that have been delivered are the right thing to do. He had to do it. But well, the, the, uh, this, they, they yes. heard, but he the had to do it. The argument is they came too late. I mean, like, th that's, that's the interesting thing is that, you know, like, I'm sure there's people out there that think, oh, they're going to do something about the Reserve Bank so they don't put interest rates up. Yeah, I mean, the, no, the, exactly. it's the opposite, right? Fair. I mean, no. the argument is that they should have done it faster. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's... You're in, you in his golf club or something. <laughs> you, you're, you're just... I don't think we've ever met. Sitting here just defending this is them. This is the point for um, ha households, for businesses. Is any of this going to change those decisions on interest rates? I mean, we don't know. Well, no, but I mean, you know, no central bank in the world at the moment really is, is not raising interest rates Correct. at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, although that, that is sometimes a, you know, a vexed issue, I mean, it's a vexed issue and that's why we put it in the hands of bureaucrats in the first place. But, you know, it's if a, inflation were out of control, we'd be in a much worse... You know how we were always worse, told yeah. that there was this Shangri-La period during the, you know, hawk keating years where we're all talking about microeconomic policies? Like, but, like, I mean, I think this could be great for economic literacy. Just get all these people flying. In Parliament or in the just public? Just everywhere, just out there on, you know, wherever they're going, on, on, put them on KISS FM. Speaking of economic... Carl and Jackie O. <laughs> Speaking of economic literacy, here's a fun fact. The only person with an economics degree on the Expenditure Review Committee is the Prime Minister. Mm. With a... Sorry, with an... With an economics, an degree. economics degree. degree. What's Jim Chalmers got? He's got What's a degree in political, political science. science. There you go, Dr yeah. Chalmers. Um, He's got a PhD in Paul Keating. As far as the... <laughs> It's true, it yeah, does. The new appointments to the uh, existing board that were made, and I was just asking the Minister about that. The opposition, while they've been supportive of the review's recommendations here in, in principle, when it comes to those two appointments the government made, there was a bit of criticism from Angus Taylor of the process followed. We want intellectual diversity. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the review laid that out very plainly and I very much endorse the need for that. Uh, the point is there is a very clear process, a rigorous process, a merit-based process that's laid out in Recommendation 14.2 of the report and the government hasn't followed it with its first two appointments. Does he have a point? Oh, I mean, look, I, I had some concerns about the background of the two appointees, but as soon as Angus Taylor started criticising it, I suddenly realised the government was probably on the right track. Oh. And it's... I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but the argument of having the guy that's got the background of the ACTU is that they need more labour market experience, right? Yeah. And the review said that as well. Yeah. Labour market yeah. expertise was one of the things that was, was on yeah. their list. But I think that this just yeah. shows, I mean, across the board, and I think the government's recognised this in other ways, that depoliticised appointment processes are important for a lot of things. But I think as this board goes forward, that's going to be important. Well, there'll be two boards that can make a lot more appointments. Well, yes. uh, speaking of the shadow ministry... Um, the week began with another departure. Karen Andrews uh, announced that she was stepping back to the back bench and will leave at the next election. Uh, and along the way, had a bit of advice for Peter Dutton. Stop talking for the first so time. much about the voice and get back to cost of living. I think that we should be absolutely focused on issues that are affecting people 
on their daily, in their daily lives. Now, people are struggling to pay their mortgage, they're struggling to pay their rent, they're struggling to find um, a, a house. So those are the things that are important and that's what impacts people. Now, the voice is an important issue and I'm not saying at all that it's not important. Mm, but listen, pour one out for that lady today because people forget, and, and we were talking about it before we came to the program, 2009, she humiliated Peter Dutton. He tried to pack his swag in his little bag and <laughs> jump electorates and get into this electorate. She was running a it for person, right? And she, through some sort of alliance with some local liberal matriarch, just absolutely snotted him and he had to, like, go off with his tail between so his So how's that relationship been since? Well, I don't know. You tell Unch me. But it doesn't sound like he I fought think. for... Yeah, right. And, and so... And, and, you know, like, I mean, she's kind of... She, she has been, like, a, a good, you know, like, truth teller. She had the guts to sort of say something about Scott Morrison and the ministries where I think that Peter Dutton should have been a bit, um, you know, stronger. But, I mean, there's clearly no love lost... There. Yeah, well, I don't know. The, 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 the Libs can't afford to lose too many women in senior roles, right? So there's well, it looks like they can. <laughs> um, I, I've heard there was a little bit of question mark over the numbers in um, in her pre-selection. Might have been a factor here. I, 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 I don't know. But it's a loss, I think, for Karen Andrews to go. Jo Julian Lisa, last week, he went because of the position they've landed on mm. when it comes to the voice, and it meant this reshuffle that was required. Um, Peter Dutton's promoted... Uh, Jacinda Nampagimba Price on the program last week. Uh, she becomes Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians. James Patterson, a Victorian, uh, becomes Shadow Home Affairs. And McCully Cash, um, who's already in Shadow Cabinet, becomes the uh, Shadow Attorney General. Uh, what do you make of these changes? Where does it leave the Liberal Party? Well, Price's promotion was the, the big change yep. because she's you know, affiliated to the Nats rather than the Liberals, so it required a, a shift there. Uh, they moved away from the quota system uh, that they have in place for front bench positions between the Nats and the Libs. Apparently it's not as fixed and uh, no, no, rigid well, as... Libs like not. to tell us when it comes to gender that they don't believe in quotas, but they have a fixed quota system generally between the Nats and the Libs. At the end of the day, if, if, if Peter Dutton wants to make the voice an issue, which he clearly does, then within that scope, promoting price into that portfolio is a good move. It's a risky move, but on in the ground that he wants to tread, it's a good move. We'll see whether it ends up being a good move beyond the ground that he wants to tread. Uh, it certainly isn't following the Karen Andrews advice of focusing on cost of living over the voice because this will accentuate uh, the divide in that debate and it will accentuate the politicisation. Well, it hardens their position, right, when it yeah. comes to the no campaign. Some moderates are a little worried about this, the risk of putting a first-termer into such a prominent role right now, but... I don't know, did Peter Dutton really have many options here? Well, I mean, the position's about as hard as it can possibly get, I suppose, at the moment. I mean, fo like, talking about focusing on cost of living is one thing, but I guess what I come back to is mm. what do you have to say when you focus on it? Because it's one thing to talk about, oh, the price of everything goes up under Labor. But unless you've got something to offer about how you would kind of dispel the current cost of living crisis, then it starts to sound... Well, it's a, a good bit... point, because they tried that in the lead-up to the Aston by-election. It was all about cost of living, cost of living. Every question in Parliament was about blaming Labor for... Uh, well, what and would it, you yeah, do? It didn't really There's... work out so well. I mean, I think that it's a no-brainer if you're going to go with that no, no idea to put Senator Price in that portfolio, right? I mean, she is going. She has got that star quality. Mm. She's articulate. She's going to be able to lead a debate. It's not going to make some people in the party feel very comfortable. But like, who else would you put in, right? Um, but you know, like, I think more broadly, uh, they're going to have to come up with something for the budget, as we discussed earlier. And I mean, I assume they're just going to do another one of those superannuation for houses thing. I mean, like, do they have any other ideas? Uh, we'll see. Look, as for the direction they're going... I mean, we know this is dark days for the Liberal Party, right? Aston by-election, state election losses. Uh, the polls are terrible. There was another shocker this week. Has Peter Dutton on negative 28 uh, in terms of his um, net support levels? In fact, in Queensland, it's what's, slightly what's worse. What's the baseline Is he Mr 18% now? Where is he? Uh... Well, he's negative 28. Uh, no, but that's a confusing one. What's the actual... I don't know. <laughs> right. Anyway, the point is, it's all bad. Uh, yeah. there's, there's not been much good news. He gave a speech during the week in Adelaide, the Sir John Downer oration, and mm. it was notable that, well, he didn't really signal any, you know, change of course back to the centre at all. In the cycle of politics, parties will be down, but, of course, they're never out. We've been there before and we've come back. And Winston Churchill, of course, said famously of his own trials and tribulations, that this is the lesson, never give in, never, never, never. And that must be the approach. 
Never, never, never. Fight them on the beaches. <laughs> well, Winston Churchill also moved between the Liberals and the Conservatives and changed his political ideology. True. So if Peter Dutton's going to stick the course on an ideology that more and more Australians as younger and younger voters start yeah. hitting voting age don't agree with, uh, not to mention a whole chunk of women as well, then he's going to face longer term problems. I don't necessarily agree with him though. But part of that oration was this idea that, you know, we're in a much better position because mummy and daddy are not fighting, right? We're like, we're just not saying boo to anything. Sometimes having a good old fight after a big defeat is cathartic and useful. Um, yeah. Well, look at John Howard. I mean, he went to the 87 election as opposition leader, not in unified coalition with the Nationals. Now, they lost that election, but they got 49 point something percent of the two-party vote. And ultimately, that was part of the process that helped realign the Liberal Party towards victory further down the track. They've got to accept defeat requires change if they want to get back on anything other than a failure by the Labor government. And they didn't do that after 2013. They got back on the failures of Rudd and Gillard and the leadership turmoil that Tony Abbott did a great job as an opposition leader of stoking. Mm -hmm. But as a result, they didn't go through the cathartic process of what do we need to do differently. They did do that after the 1983 defeat of the Fraser government, but it was a long cathartic a process long, over 13 long, years, long, and that's uh, what this generation yeah. fears. Now, despite Karen Andrews' advice, um, the Libs were, uh, uh, again this week, talking a lot about The Voice, followed the release of an opinion from the Solicitor General. This is not the advice that went to Cabinet, that remains confidential, but um, basically the Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, asked the Solicitor General to answer uh, some questions that critics had been raising and for that to be made public, which, which it was. Now, Stephen Donoghue, KC, take a look at it. Uh, he says in his written opinion that's now been made public that The Voice would not impose any obligations upon the executive government to follow representations of The Voice or to consult with The Voice prior to developing any policy or making any decision. Uh, he went on to say it would not have a power of veto, uh, it would not fetter or impede the exercise of existing powers, um, indeed, he said the voice would enhance Australia's system of representative and responsible government. Uh, case closed, said the Prime Minister, but I think he was realistic to, enough to know that it wasn't going to stop the, the criticism from um, Peter Dutton and the opposition, and it didn't. I just love the irony that Peter Dutton wants to see the full advice revealed, that is, to include what Cabinet was provided, when he was the guy who was begging Christian Porter as Attorney-General not to release the advice of the Solicitor General around his citizenship when he was trying to take over the leadership. Look, we're not going to see that full advice that went to Cabinet. My understanding, it was actually shorter than the 24-page public opinion that was released on Friday. It basically didn't argue to remove executive governments. It said, here are some options if you're you know, worried about the concern from some of the Conservative critics here. Here are some options to consider. But it's very clear, isn't it, um, Tom, in, in this public opinion, that he's, he's very comfortable with where they've landed. Yeah, that's it. And, I mean, you can quibble about which type of Solicitor General advice it is, but he wrote it. It was unambiguous. It was declarative. And he went probably further than he maybe even needed to in, in straying into the territory that you're suggesting that it would be an enhancement to our system of government. So I think it was, you know, I think it is case closed, really. Yeah, but, I mean, what do you think, Sam? The um... Oh, well, I mean, politically, I just thought it was funny that... Um... You know, the coalition was obviously spending weeks saying, release the advice, release the advice. And then they release some advice and it's a bit like someone ordering, you know, eggs and hollandaise at the restaurant. And then they're like, I wanted the sauce on the side, right? You know, like, it's like, <laughs> hey, the eggs are there, OK? Um, so, like, well, it was just a bit funny, right? Because they were saying they wanted it and then they got it and it looked embarrassing. But the, but the broader point I would make on it is this. I mean, lawyers are going to lawyer, right? And so this whole idea, which we've seen a lot in recent days, that somehow because some lawyer writes a piece of advice, that that is, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, it's a piece of advice, right? Yeah, he's not the High Court. He's not the High Court. And, and, and he he's might not the High be Court in 20 might be, years. Who knows what that is? He be. might be wrong, mm. right? Yeah, but the, the, it might the, still the go is, to the High if Court. If we're going to look for expert advice right now as we make this decision, you've got former High Court judges, former High Court Chief Justice, you've got the Solicitor General, you've got you know, people like Brett, Brett Walker. Walker. And Tum Brett Walker was good at the committee. He was interested. So does, does the No campaign really have to focus on other concerns about the voice other than the, the constitutional risk, or do they... They keep this up. What do you think? I think they'll walk and chew gum at the same time. They'll do both. Uh, they'll. I mean, that's part part of their effort here is to stoke some fear so that people stick with what the constitutional construct currently is and vote no. That will require them to have a little bit of nuance with the argument, but they'll just 
steamroll over this advice and say, so what? You know, uh, the constitutional document doesn't say anything about implied political free speech, but it got interpreted into the constitution subsequently. You know, they will run those scare campaigns. But surely they've got to drop this whole idea that secretly the Solicitor General oh, that, has that, a big concern about the voice. But they'll just say that the Solicitor General won't know what a High Court in 10, 20, 50 years from now might do in how it interprets what's there. That's true. Uh, it's a matter of whether or not that scares enough people into voting no or whether, you know, um, from the heart, I suppose, people decide to vote yes. I doubt that a lot of the people that may end up voting no or that they're pitching to have paid any attention to the Solicitor's General advice coming out. I think that's probably true. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that's, that's probably fair. Uh, that's not to say there won't be other arguments in the mix mm. that, uh, that do sway people, but, um, yeah, anyway, we'll see uh, how that all pans out. Our panel, Samantha Maiden, Peter Van Onselen and Tom Crowley will be back shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with Mawali man and comedian, the one and only Benny Egmelis. And a very warm welcome and you have just recently got into cartooning yourself. Yes, we have. We just launched the Indigiverse. Which is? The Aboriginal superhero universe. So Dark jump art. online, indigiverse.au, and get yourself a copy. Benny, politics has always been a numbers game, especially when it comes to the budget, and it's budget time of year. Um, Brett Lethbridge sees the budget as a, uh, a large silverback. I think Jim uh, Chalmers, the treasurer, he's hoping it'll be upgraded to a goldback gorilla. <laughs> well. Uh, judging by his hair, mate, he's uh, had some budget cuts himself. He's, so. he's given himself a budget cut. Mate, and I think it's confused the gorilla. <laughs> I'm here to give the old boy a haircut. You're new at this, aren't you? Yeah. Fiona Katowskis, uh, Jim's budget fixes. Um, I can't help with the cash flow, but I can put a spanner in the works. What you promised during an election has real world consequences. When you get into power, people actually expect you to do it, right? Raise the rate. Yep, and if you don't, well, these tents are appropriate. That's glamping. Glamping. Father Bob uh, died very sadly this week, but um, we've got this lovely David Pope cartoon where he's uh, the ghost in the corner. Uh, good news, the comrades upstairs agreed to delay my check-in until after the budget. So where are you up to? Uh, keeping an eye on um, Jim and Albo here about Raise the Rate. Well, somebody's got to keep an eye on them. Yep. Benny, uh, Peter Dutton may still be the life of the party, um, but the coalition did a little bit of reshuffling itself and um, some people reshuffled all the way out the door. Tom Redd from Irrational Fear did this meme. Um, Barnaby saying loads of people are saying no. To The Voice. Uh, to whoever voting for us again, says Simon Birmingham. Cathy Wilcox has drawn on the, the great broad church that they like to call the Liberal Party, and uh, it seems to be getting extended out here to the right a great deal with um, making more space. I think they're about three leans short. <laughs> moderate centre and right wing. Um, and um, to the left here, the moderates seem to have exited. <laughs> I would too. Yeah. Benny, it's the legal drama that's captured the world's attention, but Dominion versus Fox News didn't even make it to court in the end. They'd selected the jury, but uh, there was a last-minute settlement, and boy, what a settlement. 1.2 billion Australian dollars. Well, I think uh, TV series on Fox now are going to be uh, $350. <laughs> <laughs> Probably disturbing cartoon of the week, our friend David Rowe, who's nuded both Donald Trump and Rupert Murdoch up. Really? Do, do we really need to see this? Uh, they look like giant warts, if you ask me. <laughs> and the Fox News presented here. It's the Emperor's New Clothes with the faux news um, um, gown on them all. $788 million. That's a lot of hush money. Well, that's probably why they're naked. They've had to throw it all in. Yeah. Shirt off their backs. <laughs> Beautiful Megan Herbert, who's, uh, who's sort of thinks that the only safe way to do things is go back to the analogue days, Benny. After extensive research, we are pleased today to unveil a series of consumer devices designed to be completely impervious to cyber attack. The ceramic piggy bank, the old dial phone, um, letters and, of course, the typewriter. I love a good old phone like this. Back then, Siri was my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> Benny, thanks for coming on. It's been a great pleasure on picking the events this week. I'll let you do the honours. Back to you, David. Thank you, Benny, and thank you, Mike, as well. Let's get some final observations. Uh, Tom, starting with you. 
Well, one of the things that came out of the RBA review was a culture where junior employees were afraid to contradict their bosses. Um, it's something that I think will be common to anyone who's worked in a large organisation, but it's a particularly persistent problem with public institutions. We heard a lot of that with the Robo Debt Royal Commission. We've seen a bit of it in Victoria this week in the Victorian Public Service. I think that the state of frank and fearless advice that we expect from our public servants is not where it should be at the moment. I know it's something that's on the government's agenda. I think that fixing that should be priority number one. Yeah, not an easy thing to fix. Uh... Um, you know, in, in an instance. So, that, yeah, it's a good point, though. Peter? We talked about Stage 3 tax cuts earlier in the program. Ed Husick, the Industry Minister this week, uh, gave some comments that were the strongest I've seen, suggesting that they weren't going to change their position on Stage 3 tax cuts. Now, look, uh, he's not, you know, the sole arbiter of this. He may have egg on his face. So, at a, at a sort of macro level, I guess, you know, that he can get overruled by the Prime Minister and the Treasurer. But at a micro level, he is senior within the New South Wales right of the Labor Party. And I think if he's saying that, so are a number of other people in the New South Wales right privately. Mm. But do you think they would... I don't think they would before the election, certainly. And to your earlier point, it'd be something they'd have to take to an election. That's what I think they should do politically, but we'll see. Yeah, Sam. Well, macro, micro, uh, it's worth reflecting that long before our friend Peter the V to the O over here was spotting his ageing male hip-hop artist look, <laughs> Jacinta Price hey. was actually a hip-hop... I mean that in a loving way. A hip-hop artist, Flavor Fort. She was in a number of hip-hop acts... Uh, she had a mohawk and I assume she's going to bring that showbiz style to the No campaign. So look it up. Um, she's got a, a hip-hop style that's possibly <laughs> even better than this one. Yeah, you're talking about the backstory of uh, our senior politicians uh, a little earlier. That is quite the backstory. All right, thank you all very much uh, for joining us this morning. Finally, Mark Speakman was elected Liberal leader in New South Wales on Friday. But as the media anxiously waited outside the party room to see who would emerge with the crown, there was one false alarm. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not me. <laughs> all right, are we all right? I'm great. I'm great. You're making us all feel very excited about being here.